All right, I will start now. Um, hello and welcome to this press briefing on MPOX. My name is Annegret Bogart and I'm an editor for Medicine and Life Science at the Science Media Center Germany. Uh, since the WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern two weeks ago, um, there has been growing international attention on the MPOX situation in the Democratic Rep Republic of Congo and other African countries. This time, the dynamics of the MPOX spread can be traced back to different clades of the virus, and there are still many uncertainties regarding the characteristics and mechanism of the viral variants. Furthermore, there is strong attention on so far un an unknown sub as a, on a subvariant uh, called uh, clade 1b that so far was unknown. And to shed some light on the state of research and on, on these uncertainties, we invited three international MPOX researchers that are here with us today, and I would like to introduce them. First of all, we have with us Placide Mbala Kingbeni. He is head of the Epidemiology and Global Health Division and director of the Clinical Research Center at the National Institute on Biomedical Research in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, secondly, we have Dimir Orguina. He is professor for infectious diseases at the Niger Delta University uh, in Nigeria, and he is also a member of the International Health Regulations Emergency Committee. And um, both researchers are members of the MPOX Research Consortium in Africa. And the third expert with us today is Marianne Koopmans. She is head of the virus science department and director of the Pandemic and Disaster Center at the Erasmus Medical Center Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And she is involved in several cooperation projects with the African researchers on investigating the MPOX virus. Before I will start with my first question, I would like to point out to you, um, uh, journalists, that you can ask your questions in uh, the question and answer tool of the Zoom. Um, my colleagues will forward the questions to me and I will ask them to the experts. And furthermore, I would like to tell you that we will provide a video recording of this briefing and an automatic generated transcript shortly after the briefing. Uh, if you wish to have access to that, also to the video and the transcript, please write us an email at redaktion at sciencemediacenter.de. My colleague will yeah, post uh, this email address here in the chat, so you can um, yeah, write an email and ask us for the video and the transcript. All right, I'm done with my introduction and I would like to start with my first question to Dimir. Uh, I would like to ask you, what factors are currently causing the increased spread of the MPOX virus in Africa, and how does this outbreak now distinguish from MPOX cases in the previous years? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, I think the one of the underlying factors that uh, contributed to the upsurge of MPOX in Africa uh, related to neglect, neglect of the disease for over 50 years, and the lack of investments and also low capacity to respond. These three factors uh, underline most of what we are seeing in the upsurge of MPOX in Africa. Uh, but there are other biological reasons that could explain this. One is that the African population is a relatively young population. And to that extent, we do not have the benefit of uh, prior smallpox uh, vaccination. And of course, we know that uh, Monkeypox virus has a ecological niche in the rainforest areas of uh, Africa, mainly Central and West Africa. So the virus has a proximity to Africans and Africans of uh, the age group where they do not have the protective benefit of a prior smallpox vaccine. And there have been continuous animal spillover events to a point where the virus has evolved to such a level now that there's sustained human to human transmission. And we're having new strains of the virus emerging. And it seems these strains are even more transmissible. So a combination of these biological factors and the fact that the Af African population does not have that background immunity for MPOX and do not have the capacity also to contain outbreaks. And if there's no capacity to contain outbreaks, the outbreaks, inf uh, um, outbreaks of infectious pathogens spread. And that's why it's spreading readily in Africa because of lack of capacity. What we are witnessing in Africa now is uh, a bit different from what happened in the global um, outbreak in 2022. Uh, the global outbreak was uh, largely 
due to clade 2 um, strain of the mpox virus. Uh, more cases were reported in Europe and America, and it was largely predominantly amongst gay and bisexual men. And most uh, modes of transmission were, was via, via sexual contact. What we are seeing in Africa is a mixed picture. We're having a rising number of cases, unprecedented rising number of cases, especially in the DRC, affecting children, pregnant women, uh, to a point that it has extended this path to many of the districts in, in DRC, and also extended beyond DRC to countries in Eastern African countries that have never reported a single case of MPOX for over 50 something years. And these countries include Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and um, Kenya. Also re very remarkable, making it different from the 2022 outbreak. What is causing the challenge in the DRC is the clade one, is the clade one. Also very remarkable is that clade one has never been associated with sexual transmission. This was reported in the DRC. And a new strain has also emerged, which is the clade one B, which is also spreading and has spread to other parts of Africa. Historically, we have known that clade one is more severe, and creates more, um, uh, it associated with more mobility and mortality. And so there is a concern that if clade one spreads to other parts of Africa and other parts of the world, it will re result in more challenges to public health. And so those are the basic differences between what happened in 2022 and what is happening now. Yeah, thank you, Demi. Um... Placid, I uh, would uh, would like to continue with you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the epidemiology of the different clades and the transmission dynamics, and maybe also on the severity and the case fertility rates? Um, so uh, thank you. I think uh, Dimier uh, said um, uh, the, the frame. Um, the situation that we are having right now in DRC is uh, due to the clade one. And uh, in the past, we used to have only one clade one, uh, which is, you know, uh, almost uh, located to the west part of the country where we have like a dense uh, forest. Most of the villages, uh, the, the region uh, affected are at uh, this area. And now, since 2023, we uh, have this uh, new uh, clade one, which we call one B, uh, which is mostly at the uh, eastern part of the, the country, and where we don't have this like a huge dense forest, and the consumption of bush meat is very really limited. So, meaning that we suspect that this case is able, or I can say, um, uh, adapted to be transmitted from human to human. And, and this change the transmission dynamic, as, as Dimi say, in the past, we didn't know that um, a clay one can be easily uh, uh, transmitted uh, through uh, sexual contact. But now with the clay one B, we see uh, more uh, sex workers affected and uh, reporting more uh, sexual activities being um, uh, the, 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 I can say the main uh, source of transmission or mode of transmission uh, for this, uh, this uh, outbreak. And now uh, the situation that we're having now in the country is a kind of uh, uh, two outbreak occurring in the same country. One with the grade one A, where we see more children affected. This is the endemic, uh, 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 I can say, MPOX that we used to see in the country. And then the other one, which is new with the clade one B, where we see more adolescents and adults affected. But for now, uh, the mortality, when we compare both, we still have high mortality with clade one A compared to the clade one B, where we still have, uh, 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 we can say, a uh, 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 low uh, mortality rate when we compare uh, both uh, sides. But the, 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 the reason that we are afraid about the clade one b is because it seems really uh, comes kind of a very well adapted to a human-to-human -human transmission, and it's really easy uh, and more transmissible than the, the clade one a that uh, we, we used to see in the country. Can you say anything from the genomic uh, sequence from those two viruses? Um, what makes the difference also in the transmission? 
what made the difference of transmission, this is what we observe. First of all, is the fact that we are seeing more like apobic mutation uh, compared to the clade 1A uh, but in, in the clade 1B, uh, which may explain why the virus seems to be adapted to human to human transmission. But the other thing is also the fact that some deletion that uh, we observe there are also helping the virus to evade some of the diagnostic tests that we use uh, in the in the country. And now uh, what we would like also to, to, to know is how this clade 1B um, can also uh, vary um, when you move from, for example, Kamituga uh, to South Kivu to Goma and how the expansion is going to other countries because there are maybe a uh, small difference that need to be also uh, captured when we are, are working because uh, we observe that some of the diagnostic tests that uh, we are using are a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult sometimes to uh, diagnose some of those uh, 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 T1B samples. Yeah, thank you, Placid. Uh, Marion, yeah, please add to it. Yeah, and maybe for uh, journalists that are listening, it might be good to explain uh, a situation that is happening with every new evolving outbreak situation is that you really, uh, it is how difficult it is to get good, robust data for these very obvious questions. Is it more severe? Is it more transmissible? And you really need good studies plus the infrastructure to do those studies in order to answer those uh, questions definitively. So um, the, the, right now, I think we have to work with what we observe, but um, I, I, it, it is really difficult to know exactly uh, how different the virus uh, of, of the clade one B is from the, the viruses that we've uh, seen before. Um, the transmissibility, of course, also is determined by where a virus pops up, where maybe through bushmeat consumption, a virus started to spread. And if that happens to be in a, you know, in a region where there is a lot of uh, close uh, human to human interaction and, and the sexual network, that's a very different starting situation than if you have a spillover event in a remote village. So that's why it's very difficult. And I think it's good to understand for a journalist why it's so difficult to really answer those questions robustly. And the, the WHO and African CDC also have really called for coordinated research efforts to try and get at that information. Yeah, and um, how can this uh, public health emergency situation now and uh, help? And can they, um, yeah, what do you expect now from, um, um, yeah, from the situation, how it can help to clear and to get new results from this area? Yeah, Marion, please. Asking me? Yeah. Um, well, I think, so people may have seen that WHO has to put together with African region leaders has put together a very uh, a, a concrete plan of action for the coming six months, uh, which has many different uh, uh, pillars. Uh, it is about uh, building or in strengthening the capacity to know where these viruses are and are moving by by both uh, um, having health, uh, uh, public health expertise, but also diagnostic capacity and sequencing capacity. That's one important element. Another is uh, have strengthening the ability to treat patients. Um, there was a recent trial completed with Placida, I think, <laughs> which um, unfortunately the medication did not seem to do that much, but it, it, it did show some very promising information that if you have access to good care, the outcomes really are better. So that can be further built. And then uh, of course, also understanding where these viruses come from, why do we see these spillovers uh, increasing? 
And then finally, the, the research needs, but also actions around vaccination. Uh, so that's a big uh, combined plan uh, that really calls for a lot of activities and everyone can read uh, what, what the request is there. Yeah, from the future back to what we know already, uh, I would like to raise the first question. Um, what is now known about co-infections in the current clade 1, A and B, like, um, for example, co-infection with HIV or TB or other uh, infectious diseases? Can, yeah, Dimir or Placid, can you say something to that question? Okay, I will just make some comments and allow Placid to um, conclude. Um, Co-infections is a reality uh, for whether clade one or clade two, uh, because ultimately, especially in Africa, we have uh, several endemic infections uh, that could coexist uh, with uh, one another, each other. And it's not different from mpox. Uh, let me speak about our experience with clade two mpox uh, in uh, Nigeria, for instance. Uh, from 2017, when we first uh, reported uh, the outbreak of mpox in Nigeria, that was the first time we observed the co-infection with uh, HIV. And then we had some patients that had uh, syphilis and what looked like other sexually transmitted infections, such as uh, chancroid, the instinct for mempox. Uh, that's to tell you that uh, there is some relationship between some of these sexually transmitted infection and uh, mempox. Uh, in 2022, we, and even from subsequent outbreaks of mpox, uh, clade 2 mpox in, in Nigeria, for instance, uh, what we have not noticed significantly is a co-infection with the uh, virus cellar zoster virus, that's chickenpox. So uh, close to 30% of uh, mpox uh, cases in uh, the Nigerian court had the uh, concomitant uh, chickenpox infection. And in one of the reviews that we published, uh, those that had concomitant chickenpox infection were more likely to have severe disease and to die. Uh, of course, those that also had advanced HIV were also more likely to have severe disease and to die. Uh, so I think the spectrum of co-infection that relates to mpox is something that we need to unravel. Uh, maybe Placid will talk about the role of measles, malaria, and other uh, prevalent endemic infections uh, in many African countries and how they will have impacted on the outcome, clinical outcome of uh, cases of mpox. Because ultimately, we are not just treating mpox, and that's a challenge in Africa. It is not only a challenge of mpox, it's also the challenge of pre existing, coexisting endemic infections that can compound the clinical and natural history of mpox and anything we are doing about the response to mpox. Uh, so I think co infection is an area that we need to explore further to really understand how it impacts on the natural history of uh, mpox. I will hand over to Placid. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dimier. So uh, according to uh, a few studies that uh, we conduct here in the, in the country, uh, most of um, co-infections are mostly, I can say, um, uh, endemic infection that we see here. So like malaria, uh, intestinal uh, parasite infection. Uh, uh, HIV, it's very low because the prevalence of HIV in the country is about like 1.5. 1.4 percent. So we have seen some cases of maybe four, three cases uh, um, of mpox with HIV, but uh, we didn't see any uh, kind of um, uh, like severe disease related to to uh, HIV. Maybe because they have a good uh, CD4, uh, so like good immunity or good CD4 count counted. Uh, that time. So most of the infection that we see, uh, we have about like 20% of uh, co-infection with chickenpox. But in our context, we didn't see any kind of uh, like, uh, we see some severity, but not uh, fatality related really to uh, this uh, co-infection. Most of the co-infection that we found, I can say, a bit fatal when associated with uh, mpox was mostly a pneumonia, so like super or um, uh, bacteria uh, super infection, uh, which can cause pneumonia, uh, encephalitis mostly, uh, both. 
those are, I can say, um, those protection. And uh, right now with the new study, we see also um, cases of sickle cells, uh, anemia, malnutrition, and with the huge uh, measles uh, outbreak that we are having in the country, we also see uh, a kind of a high mortality among under five. And uh, in uh, most of the reports uh, coming from like MSF and others, they also see this uh, kind of confection with uh, measles. So this can be also uh, one of the reasons we see maybe this high mortality in children under five, for example, in some some places in the culture. There's actually one question added to that, um, asking um, the figures for children vary greatly, even between countries. What do we know? But uh, I mean, you partly uh, answered this now, but are there other reasons why there are difference uh, between cases of children and between two different countries? Uh, maybe quickly what I can say, I think uh, Maria and Dimitri can, uh, can complete. Um, for our, our situation, for example, in DRC, uh, when we compare the two clade, the clade 1A, which is more zoonotic uh, than human-to-human uh, uh, -human, uh, infection, we see more introduction, more zoonotic uh, diseases, and, and children under 15 are more affected. Why? Because we suspect that uh, the reservoir are probably small mammals that are usually hunted by uh, small children. So, uh, yeah. And so they get infected. And so they can bring the disease to the household. And uh, most of the time, infect also their um, uh, uh, siblings in the same, the same household. Because how uh, the the culture also in the rural area, it's mostly, you will see that um, there is a young, uh, like a, a young children, like 14 or 15, who is taking care of the, the, the small one because the father are uh, in the, the, the forest doing agriculture or, or working to find food to bring back home. So meaning that this person who is under uh, um, uh, 15 is the one who will take care of the, 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 the small one. And so if it's infected, it'll be very easy to also pass uh, the infection uh, to, to other in, a, in the same household. So this yeah. can expand. And even when we go to the uh, clade one B, we see, first of all, this pattern with adolescent and adult, but very quickly we are seeing also more children uh, affected because when the adult and adolescent are affected, they bring the disease in the household and they can then transmit to other family members. So I don't know, um, yeah, Maria and Dini can, uh, can talk with you. Yeah, Maria, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think it's, imp uh, uh, it's important to also understand that different countries may have different clades, so there's differences in the clades, and uh, indeed this age profile, and for 1B, because it's uh, pri primarily currently young adults that also includes, for instance, pregnant women, there we see a very severe um, uh, profile where particularly uh, pregnancy loss seems to be a big problem. The numbers are fortunately that, not that high, but that seems to be quite severe in that particular uh, uh, group. Uh, and that includes, um, the birth of infected babies that are infected uh, during in utero uh, with severe outcomes there as well so there it's it's really the age profile of the outbreak that also determines in part which complications that you uh, end up seeing all right thanks um there is a question that was actually raised twice. Um, so how great do you estimate the risk of confusing mpox with chickenpox? So we are in diagnostics back again. Uh, is chickenpox currently also being diagnosed or tested um, more frequently? And what is chickenpox vaccination rate in the affected countries? So let, let me just uh, <clears throat> attempt to also make uh, contributions uh, regarding the Age, age uh, distribution of mpox and also address right. this issue of uh, chickenpox. Yeah. Uh, in Nigeria, for instance, uh, since 2017, when we observed the resurgence of mpox in the country, 
uh, about 70% or so of um, the affected persons or infected laboratory confirmed cases are, were adults between the ages of 20 to 40 years. And that has been consistent from 2017 to date. Although in 2024, we have just less than 40 cases. And it seems that the number of children impacted is about half or so of this number of um, uh, 40 cases that have been reported in the country. It's not very clear whether the outbreak is now transiting to, uh, to affect children. Not very clear. And it's actually very curious that uh, we have not had significant number of children infected uh, with Mpox in Nigeria over the last five years. And uh, there could be several reasons for that. One could be the mode of transmission. It is possible that uh, the uh, transmission dynamics of Mpox in Nigeria is largely sexually limit related. And that's why it's occurring amongst adults. Uh, it's also possible that we in Nigeria, there is a challenge in distinguishing chickenpox and mpox. And as, as you know, chickenpox is a very frequent infection in children in Nigeria and I believe in most African countries. And usually when people have chickenpox, they don't come to the hospital. They are treated at home, self-medication. Uh, so is it possible that we are missing out on mpox in children in Nigeria because we are now confusing chickenpox as mpox? Uh, I think that's also a probability, and that's an area that we need to look dive deep into to determine whether some of these cases that we have uh, categorized or classified as chickenpox were actually uh, mpox cases. And I think that's something to do because we are seeing mpox, chickenpox co-infection very frequently, especially in Nigeria. Uh, from the cases of mpox and chickenpox I have seen over the years, sometimes it becomes very, very difficult to clinically distinguish mpox from chickenpox because we are getting to a point where we have a typical presentation of um, mpox. Even chickenpox is a typical presentation, especially amongst people with advanced uh, uh, retroviral disease. Uh, so I always say that if you want a confirmatory evidence of the differences between mpox and chickenpox, you rely on the laboratory for that. Uh, but essentially, uh, based on clinical experience and what has been published in the literature over time, Mpox lesions are more deep-seated. Uh, they have significant pruritus. Uh, they have more significant uh, sore throats. Uh, they are likely to have lymphadenopathy compared to chicken pox. They are more uh, as, uh, in these extremities uh, compared to chicken pox that is uh, more central uh, and the uh, mpox lesions are more likely to affect the palms and the soles as opposed to chicken pox. Well, but I have seen chicken pox cases that affected palms and soles. Uh, mpox lesions, especially when it's sexually related, is more likely to cluster around the genital and groin area. And the uh, mpox lesions are largely bigger in size than chicken pox. Mpox lesions, on the average, are fewer in number than when you compare to chicken pox. But having said all this, it's also very difficult. As I said, sometimes it's difficult to clinically distinguish mpox uh, from chicken pox. I don't know the, I'm not fully aware of the rate of uh, chicken pox vaccination in the, in the, for instance, in Nigeria. Uh, the, the rate at which we are seeing chicken pox, even amongst adults, so it's also very alarming. We expected that, uh, uh, we should see more chicken pox in children in Nigeria, but we are seeing a number of uh, chicken pox cases in adults. And that tells you that um, uh, population immunity too for chicken pox is also limited. Over to others. Yeah, so maybe on the diagnostic side, I'm not, I'm don't, I'm not familiar with Nigeria, but I do think uh, uh, chicken pox diagnostics, differential diagnostics are not very widely available. Uh, I mean, the, there's already uh, uh, a big effort to try and build diagnostic capacity for mpox uh, across the region, let alone differential. So, but I do think for companies that are working on rapid tests, the combination assays are really uh, would would be fantastic <laughs> if that kind of uh, um, investment is put forward. But over to Placid on the. Sorry, before Placid says something, just to say that for Nigeria. Um, I think since 2017 or so, or maybe 2018, uh, chickenpox or varicella zoster virus is routinely done for every case with uh, mpox that comes to the public health system. 
So there's laboratory diagnosis for chicken pox, and that has been routine since uh, 2018 or so. Yeah, plus, okay. Um, coming, uh, yeah, plus. Just quickly, yeah, in, in our case, just to make uh, uh, the contrast, in our case in DRC, um, the disease that is under surveillance is MPOX. Uh, but at the same time, when, for example, for all cases that are MPOX negative, we also test for uh, chicken pox. So it's uh, almost the same with like a measles and rubella. So we, uh, the, the disease, this is under surveillance is measles. But as we know that both diseases can uh, clinically present the same, uh, are similar. So we, for all uh, uh, samples, uh, tested negative for uh, measles, we test for rubella. So what we found is that in most of the area, we can see both outbreaks occurring at the same time or sometimes a confusion. So you have more cases of uh, chicken pox in somewhere that are you know, wrongly reported as, as mpox and, and, vice, uh, and vice versa. And also what I can uh, mention here is the fact that um, it's really important um, for our, our country, we have a variability of a positivity uh, in samples when we compare with the clinical uh, diagnostic. I mean that um, in area where they used to see MPOX cases, they usually are good in clinical diagnostics. So you can have a kind of positivity that can reach like 80 or 90%. And in other regions where, you know, they used to see like sporadic cases of MPOX, there the positivity, uh, the confusion is small with uh, chicken pox. And then you can see the positivity rates that vary maybe like under, can be under like 30%. But now with the outbreak, as the attention is more on MPOX, we see that most of uh, those regions who are seeing, who are seeing cases, uh, the positivity rate uh, is uh, in increasing because they are now used to, to diagnose. The, but as uh, Dimi say, when you, uh, you are uh, facing like a typical uh, 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 cases of MPOX or chicken pox, it's become difficult to, to make the diagnostic. And then you need to, to collect samples and do a lab diagnostic. Yeah, coming from diagnostics right. to... Um, to treatment, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, what are the current treatments? Is there anything available or is there anything um, that is coming? Dimi, uh, do you want to say something about treatments? Are there okay, so I'll, I'll start and allow others to also make comments. So um, uh, we know that MPOX uh, is, is referred to as a self-limiting illness. Uh, it means that uh, uh, majority of persons will ultimately recover um, largely from supportive care. So the mainstay of treatment of MPOX for now is uh, supportive uh, symptomatic care uh, to address uh, the uh, major signs and symptoms and troubling um, challenges uh, that the patients present with. And uh, most of these challenges include uh, fever, pruritus, uh, the skin rash, uh, ulcers, and then if they have complications, uh, common complications include uh, sepsis, uh, broken pneumonia, encephalitis. And uh, if it is uh, sexually related, they could have um, proptysis and uh, urethral obstruction. Uh, what we are seeing in people with advanced uh, retroviral disease, we have necrotic, uh, necrotizing uh, skin lesions. I've seen a number of cases even in Nigeria. And uh, some people with uh, advanced HIV also come up with uh, complications. Uh, it's also important to pay attention to the psychological health, mental health of uh, persons with MPOX because they are prone to uh, stigma, fear, anxiety. Uh, for instance, in Nigeria, in the 2017 outbreak, uh, one of our patients committed uh, uh, suicide on account of uh, the diagnosis of MPOX. And I know a number of my patients have faced uh, psychological trauma uh, related to MPOX. So it's very important that aspect is uh, addressed. Of course, nutrition is also very important. Uh, MPOX cases have this significant sore throat, and uh, that makes it difficult for them to even uh, poor appetite, and they don't they're not able to eat. And so, uh, nutritional support is also uh, very very important in the management of MPOX. Uh, so, so generally, supportive care addresses the the challenges that the patients face, and ensuring that you 
uh, do it on a case by case basis because these challenges may vary from one case to the other. Then if we talk about therapeutics, uh, of course, the, the, the drugs that have been known to be available uh, for MPOX includes uh, tecoviramat and um, bring cetophobil and cetophobil. Uh, these are some of the drugs that have been used in the past and used currently in the management of MPOX. So for instance, observational studies have shown that tecoviramat could improve resolution of, uh, of uh, symptom skin lesions in the among patients with MPOX in the Global North. A few of these observational studies were done uh, in the Global North, in Europe and America. Uh, but as you highlighted in the initial uh, introduction or so, uh, the study that was done in the DRC did not show uh, significant benefits uh, on the use of uh, uh, tecoviramat in terms of re improving res uh, clinical resolution of uh, patients with MPOX. I know that uh, brain cetophobia and cetophobia have been used uh, on an experimental basis uh, in the management of MPOX, or should I say compassionate or emergency use. And animal models, animal studies have shown that uh, they could be effective. And there are a number of drugs on the pipeline for management of MPOX, and uh, I've had the opportunity of looking at that pipeline. One intriguing aspect of what I saw is uh, the use of ribavirin. Uh, Animal models and some other studies have shown that ribavirin may be uh, a potential candidate uh, for, for MPOX. I say that because ribavirin, for instance, in West, West, West Africa is being used uh, for management of Lassa fever. Uh, so there's some experience. So I think we will need to invest more in uh, uh, understanding the landscape of MPOX uh, therapeutics, especially. Uh, but it's actually very unfortunate that we have MPOX for 54 years. And it took the global outbreak for us to rethink therapeutics. And this is the time we are rethinking therapeutics. We had 54 years to do that. And then we have limited numbers of therapeutics for MPOX. Just for now, tecoviramat, which is shown not to be effective or efficacious in that context of clinical trials for CLAD1. Of course, we are not sure what the impact for CLAD2, uh, but for CLAD1, it has been shown. So I, I, I think it's actually unfortunate and there's need for us for for more investments and to widen the landscape of therapeutics so that we have uh, more, more drugs that we can use to manage our cases and improve our clinical outcome. Over to Placid and Marion here. Yeah. Marion, quickly, then yeah. we move on. Time is, the time is running. Time's running, right. So the, it may be good to mention that in, uh, in these uh, emerging diseases, so I fully support the need for studies, clinical trials within affected regions, obviously. But <clears throat> with these emerging infections, quite often you have to go by what is called the animal rule, where you have to rely on preliminary data of possible uh, candidates based on animal studies, but they do not always really predict the outcomes in humans. And we've seen a good example of that with Tecovirimat, which looked pretty good in the preclinical in animal models, but unfortunately the trial that was just uh, uh, done did not uh, replicate that success. So it is really important to do the studies um, even when embedded in an outbreak. And that's that's very complex, but and it requires big investments. Yeah, thank you. Placid, I would like to continue from thank treatment you. to vaccination, maybe. Just, okay. yeah, no, just, no, just quickly to mention the fact that uh, uh, it's on the, the treatment, I think Dimier and, uh, and Marion uh, emphasized on the treatment, and it's very important. What I would like to mention here, it's mostly stigma stigma and discrimination, which is really important. And we observe that also in our context, uh, since most of the zoonotic uh, MPOX is also linked to um, like finding like dead monkey, dead uh, uh, animal in the forest. And so when a family is affected by MPOX, sometimes they are not well perceived in the community because they feel like you are not able to feed very well your family and you are getting you know like dead animals in the forest and, and so on so i think it's important to also mention that there are very different type of stigma and now as we are seeing also some msm affected some sex worker affected i think we need to make sure that we really integrate other programs other experts to make sure that we will address 
uh, this situation that's becoming more complex. Maybe this already fits quite well to the next question on vaccination. Uh, Placid, what is the vaccination strategy? Which risk groups should be vaccinated first? This is a big question. <laughs> the vaccination uh, strategy in the country is uh, uh, mostly um, oriented to the hotspot. Right now, we are thinking to uh, work on the hotspot and then target the most affected people. So we, you know, we call uh, the children under 15 and also uh, adolescents and adults in the other area and including a uh, 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 sex, uh, sex worker. But at the same time, we'll need to think because uh, we will not have enough vaccine, uh, even if we target this population in the, in the country. Uh, so we need to think about uh, what type of uh, uh, strategy we would like to use. There is another strategy that could uh, raise here is, um, for example, using a ring vaccination. So. Uh, finding contact, finding a case and trying to vaccinate around the case as we did with Ebola. Because in this case, we can target uh, the hotspot and target uh, some cases where we can um, uh, vaccinate and at the same time uh, try to uh, assess uh, those uh, vaccines in our country. Since we know that uh, the vaccine are approved to be used, but uh, uh, there is no, for the moment, uh, efficacy uh, data showing, you know, that uh, uh, the, the vaccine, the level of antibody that we are seeing can really protect uh, against a, a new infection. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mario and Dinier can comment on that. Yeah, maybe also... Um... Um, g g mentioning if children can be immunized, immunized, can you please involve that to your answer? I will defer the children to to Dimier, but uh, I think if uh, the, I saw questions also about will the vaccines work also for clay 1B? I think the honest answer is we do not know yet, but looking at the, the, the build of the virus and the <clears throat> The way the vaccines are designed, they are uh, derived from vaccinia virus. That's a, a different pox virus, uh, but that does confer cross protection. And that's been well documented with the clade 2B outbreak globally, where there also is some evidence for clinical efficacy. Although the during the, the vaccinations were given also in an evolving outbreak, when there's also other things that people do that reduce transmission. So it's 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 not so easy to say exactly is this full vaccine protection. But there, uh, so the hopes is that um, 1B would also be, so there would be sufficient cross protection, but that's, I, I, I think, an urgent uh, study uh, need. And for as for the children, uh, I would, yeah, Demia, maybe you can uh, comment. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. Just a few comments about vaccines. The first is that ultimately it's important that we invest in understanding the transmission dynamics and the risk factors and the natural history of mpox in Africa. Because any vaccine strategy should be informed by your understanding of the epidemiology of the disease in your region. And uh, I'm not sure that we fully appreciate or understand uh, transmission dynamics risk factors for mpox in, in many parts of Africa. And that's why we may ultimately have a difficulty even prioritizing some of these vaccines that are not even sufficient uh, to, to go around. It might be easier when you have uh, a, a disease that is circulating in a population uh, to, to do ring vaccination, as uh, Placid said, identify all the contacts in the, during the outbreak setting and see how you vaccinate. But when you are having scattered cases all over the country, and uh, sometimes cases are not linked, it becomes very difficult uh, to even determine who is at risk and who is not at risk. And even if you want to use theoretical basis, uh, per perhaps use children, use uh, pregnant women, and use uh, people with advanced uh, HIV, how many vaccine doses would you need to cover that uh, population? Uh, the other challenge is the uncertainties re regarding the current vaccines we have. And the uncertainties relates to the absence of uh, uh, clinical efficacy studies. 
Uh, the vaccine effectiveness studies that have been done were done in the global north for clade 2, B, and amongst gay and bisexual men. And as Marion said, there are several confounders and biases associated with um, vaccine effectiveness studies. And uh, one cannot beat your chest to say uh, the effectiveness may be only due to the vaccine alone. In fact, there are some studies that have shown that behavioral change was responsible for the decline in impulse cases in some parts of Europe and America, but vaccines also helped. But the, the other challenge is that we don't know the duration of protection of these vaccines. Uh, so I said that uh, it's also very important why we're deploying these vaccines to Africa. We must communicate these uncertainties. Whereas it may be one of the best tools we have available now based on existing knowledge, but there are still uncertainties. And uh, we have not replicated these studies, some of these studies in children. And that is a, a great challenge, especially in the DRC where majority of people impacted significantly are children. And I believe uh, the number of studies that are still ongoing in terms of safety and immunogenic studies amongst adolescents has been done. And uh, we have the alternative of LC16, which has been used in Japan and also shown to be safe in children. But there are still several uncertainties. And so I think the WHO has recommended that uh, we should use a risk benefit approach, especially during outbreak setting, in determining whether uh, children should be vaccinated. And I think that is the approach the DRC is uh, undertaking. But uh, Placid may want to add to that. Thank you. Placid, do you want to add? Uh, not really. I think uh, Dini has already uh, explained explain the, 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 the situation and it's very clear. The only thing that I would like to mention here, I see a question regarding the number of uh, vaccines and we are really concerned you know, um, because I think uh, the, um, uh, the needs for the continent is about 10 million and we see in the pipeline only about uh, 500,000 uh, and we don't know uh, when those 500,000 uh, could be available. And even if it's uh, not enough, but we still, it's still uncertain to, to when with the vaccine would be available. And at the same time, the, the disease is still progressing. Now we see that uh, we have cases in Gabon. Uh, there will be cases uh, almost uh, everywhere. It's just a matter of time. As we said, uh, 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 Marion knows that when we uh, talk about the Kanituga outbreak, we will say that it was just a matter of time to see cases appearing in other countries because we know that the population this area is very mobile, it is a great connection with other countries. So um, we will see cases everywhere. And as Dimi mentioned about the herd immunity, uh, we have about like, I don't know, 50 or 52 percent of the, the, the global population uh, may be born after uh, 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 80s and so every almost you know this uh, population is susceptible of getting uh, uh, mpox so the virus is finding a, like a, a, a good i can say environment to um, cross or travel from one to human to another to one country to to, to another so if we don't invest to uh, i guess as you may say this the, the i can say the best tool that we have, even if we don't have all the data regarding the efficacy, this is something that we should do when the vaccination will be effective, uh, but we need to have uh, uh, enough vaccine at least to provide this uh, um, uh, immunity uh, to uh, our population. Yeah, uh, since the time is actually more or less up, I hope you maybe have 10 more uh, minutes that we can ask a bit more questions because the next one fits very well. Okay, Marian, you have to give me a sign. Um, because there are also initial calls to loosen the patents for the vaccines um, so that they can also produce locally uh, in Africa. Um, some organizations are criticizing the price, um, which could be significantly lower. Um, would this be a good strategy to contain the situation and would it help or is this unrealistic? Maybe Placid, you want to add on it, or Dimi? Maybe I can say, Mario, I, yeah. I think it's... Uh, yes, Mario. 
it's a That's nice fine. thought, but um, it, that will not be a solution for the short term. So the short term really is about uh, who has vaccines, where are they to be used best next, and what is the logistics around that? I think there's there's a lot of things to be done there uh, because there's one thing that, that there are vaccines available, but that doesn't mean that the whole operation of where to put them and how to target the vaccines is in place. So that I think currently is, is a huge priority um, personally. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can continue with you with the uh, next question um, uh, on the global reaction, um, or maybe this is also for all three of you. How uh, had the WHO been too slow to act when it comes for providing emergency authorization for an mpox vaccine? And was it premature for the WHO to end the previous public health emergency before? Who wants to answer to that? Placid. Um, I don't think it's uh, uh, only WHO, it's all of our countries, because we need, you cannot wait that someone from outside tells you that you have an issue. Uh, I think we raise the situation from our country. Um, the situation was raised uh, at the continental level, this is a really a good, uh, for me, I find it as a good uh, example because in the past we used to have um, a situation raised from outside the continent and for the first time, I think the continent take this courage to say that this is a, a continental uh, situation before uh, WHO uh, 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 say that, and, and this is uh, really important. The first, the, the second one is the fact that there are some uh, consideration that we need to take into account uh, before you know making this uh, kind of decision regarding all the demand, regarding the prioritization of all those manufacturers. And as uh, Marion say, even if we want to have uh, money in the continent, there are some uh, uh, pre-level that we need to put in place that are not existing yet. So it's not a solution for a mid or short term. It may take some time. And we, we tried it with uh, um, uh, South Africa with the COVID and we saw that uh, it didn't really work as we, 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 we wanted. So I think it's a process that we need to put in place to make sure that in future we should be able to have the manufacturer in the continent that can also provide uh, enough uh, vaccine for the, uh, for, the, for the continent. I don't know, yeah, I can leave. Yeah, um, may I, uh, maybe then, then also the outside of Africa perspective, I think we have to be quite humble here because despite uh, uh, considering MPOX and, and lineage 2 as a controllable disease, we did not manage to control it with all the efforts, with all the money, with all the capacity worldwide it's still ongoing. It's not as big anymore. Um, there were vaccines uh, introduced, there were all sorts of campaigns, but we didn't control it. So it is not really easy and it is really a multi-tiered approach that you need to build um, to uh, focus on where the, the, the problem is, is uh, currently a priority but also to step away from this, what is called the cycle of panic and neglect. And that's what happened the last time. So there was a public health emergency declared in 2022 when the, the world outside of the African region experienced MPOX. It was sort of then uh, downscaled. Um, and already then there was uh, discussion and criticism from some countries, like this will mean the attention will go away, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, and this is a, a this is something that is typical for all of these emerging disease outbreaks that the world really, I think, needs to learn uh, how can we more systemically prepare for these, um, so that we don't have to 
constantly rely on jumping in response mode, but be ready. Um, and then maybe by being ready, have less bigger outbreaks or be at the spots where they are early enough to, to prevent them come, becoming so big. I think that's really the key issue that that um, that is needed. Yeah, thank you, Marion. I think it's a very good final remark already. Um, I would like to come to an end as well. Um, maybe, uh, Dimi, do you want to say um, take home message? What do you think should the journalists take from this and what do you think um, should be done to improve the situation? What is like the most important issues that also needs to be clarified? Yeah, just to say that um, ultimately, um, health itself related to a public health threat is a, a collective responsibility of uh, everybody uh, but ultimately the primary responsibility lies with the countries and uh, populations that are most impacted and it is important that uh, especially countries in africa take full responsibility for addressing uh, problems that occur in their region in terms of investments ownership and commitments uh, this is very, very important, uh, where, whereas it is important to get uh, assistance and partnership from outside Africa. We must take the bull by, uh, by the horn and invest in uh, research and development in Africa. Uh, this is a time I've said that we are working blindly, likely blindly in uh, Africa. For instance, in the DRC, only less than 40 percent of cases are tested, laboratory confirmed. That's working blindly. Uh, I believe cases in Africa are largely underreported. Uh, because a number of uh, cases are occurring, the public health system cannot uh, detect those cases. And that is not good uh, for the evolution of the virus and uh, what we see in the future. So this is a time for all of us to collectively invest in surveillance and research and development and in uh, prioritize preventive uh, interventions so that we can address this problem of MPOX. And then grade 1B or grade 1 will not also cause another global outbreak. That's something we don't want to happen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Demir. Placid, the last word to you. What are your final remarks, your take home message? And yeah. Yeah, the take home message, I think it's um, we are facing a complex situation. We have the this ongoing uh, outbreak since many years, um, neglected. Now that leads to a new variant, more transmissible. At the same time, we still have our old outbreak, the clade to one a in Nigeria and West African countries, the clade to b more cases, a few cases, not as it was in 2022, but I see cases in some countries. So meaning that uh, the autopox, the unpox is taking, you know, uh, the place. So we need to act, uh, have a kind of, uh, World coordination, very well coordination to make sure that we uh, put the resource where it should be to uh, conduct research to improve the diagnostic, to uh, improve the treatment, provide like adequate, appropriate, supportive treatment, and also uh, to work on a good communication because uh, right now we may end up. Uh, as uh, COVID with like a wrong and bad communication uh, um, uh, in the media, uh, social media. So we need also as a uh, public health leader to make sure that we also provide uh, a, a, the right information to the population. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you all three for uh, being here today. I would like to uh, finish this meeting now. Uh, I would like to uh, tell you to, to your journalists, please, thank you for attending. Thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we could not ask all your questions. Time was just flying. Um, I'm sure you can contact the experts um, after this meeting again. Um, if you would like to have a video recording or the transcript, please contact us. Uh, again, the email is uh, redaktion at sciencemediacenter.de. I hope my colleague can post it again. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, have a good day. <laughs>